What I'm suggesting, though, is that if this is a gap that they've identified themselves, in themselves, this is most definitely a gap that exists in their organization because the culture in an organization is set from the top. You're listening to Decoding Healthcare Innovation with Carrie Nixon and Rebecca Gwilt, a podcast for novel and disruptive business leaders seeking to transform how we receive and experience healthcare. Hello and welcome everyone to the latest episode of Decoding Healthcare Innovation. I am so excited to be joined today by Claudia Verlanuta, uh, who is the CEO of Etlitera, which I will tell you Etlitera, which I will tell you a little bit about uh, shortly. Today we're going to talk about a topic I know is top of mind for a lot of you, which is how we deal with the Great Resignation. This is one of the toughest labor markets in years and especially digital health companies are fighting for the best engineers and analysts, the best folks on their team from a training and a management perspective to be able to make themselves as competitive as, competitive as possible. Uh, and that is a niche where Claudia sits very, very neatly. And we're going to learn a little bit about her company and, um, and grab a bunch of her insight today. So Claudia, welcome, welcome. Thanks, Rebecca. Thanks for the awesome introduction, and it's uh, really great to be here. I'm super excited. Yeah, so let's get into it. Uh, so Ed Litera, this is your company. This is a data science and machine learning company. All of the all of the all the buzz, buzzwords, of course. Uh, you your company trains <laughs> engineers and analysts in Python, data processing, data science machine learning topics like natural language processing, computer vision, you're right there on the edge. Um, and I just love to hear a little bit about uh, what your background is, what human experience and experiences brought you to found Edlitera, uh, uh, to your CEO position as at Edlitera, and um, what are you most passionate about, about what you're doing today? Definitely. So uh, Edlitera was um, something that started accidentally, pretty much, and continued um, out of passion. Uh, so when I first, um, well, when I when I got out of school, um, I had a background in um, uh, economics and statistics and computer science, um, but I ended up working in biotech for a very small startup at the time, um, and. What ended up happening from there is that the the startup environment really jived with me. It really worked with the way my um, just kind of how my brain works. You know, it was the it was engaging. Same. Same. Yeah. Yeah. So you know things were changing all the time, and um, I really enjoyed that part of it for a couple of years. <laughs> um, and from there, I realized that what I liked best about my job was the analytics aspect of it, um, and I proceeded to basically train myself and teach myself the skills that I needed for this at the time emerging field of data science. So when this was happening, it wasn't really the buzzword that it is right now. Uh, it wasn't the case that every company had a data scientist. So when, what, what year was this? What year was this? Uh, great question. I graduated in 2011. Oh, 2011. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it seems so close and yet so far. I know, right? <laughs> I uh, really, really enjoy teaching. And this is one of those things where, um, you know, I, I knew this going out of school, but I wasn't ready to go full into a teaching career. Um, so really teaching on the side was kind of what worked the whole time and teaching myself, you know, the funny thing about teaching other people is that, it's a great way to uncover all the things that you don't know about the topic, right? So when you, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. So when you teach a, a class on literally anything, you can bet that you're going to get a question that you don't know, right? No matter how much of an expert you are on that, somebody's going to ask something that you haven't thought about. Um, so that was really what um, that was really kind of a theme in my. Um, in my education and also after that in my career, you know, like I want to, I want to learn all these things and then I want to teach them. And by teaching them, it reinforces this desire to learn, right. To, uh, to, to get even better at that. 
when I say that it literally started accidentally, it started because I got so bored at home that I really needed to do something. Um, so what I did was create a meetup group and start teaching workshops. <laughs> so what, so, so tell me, I, I mentioned a little bit about this before, you know, it's a, it's a tough time hearing it from my clients all the time. It's a tough time to hire technical staff. And even more than that, it's, it's, it's tough for some companies who are well-established to <clears throat> learn the skills that they're going to need as, as things evolve from a technology perspective going forward. T tell me, tell me from your perspective, why it's so important that pe that, that these companies are investing in data literacy and data skills and, and for whom is that important in those companies? Thanks for that question, Rebecca, because honestly, that's, it, it comes at the, um, at, it's at the heart of why what we do, um, I think, is, is so relevant and so important nowadays. Um, and <clears throat> I'll start by saying that our mission really is not to teach programming and machine learning and data science. Our mission is to make innovation skills accessible to all. Um, one thing that happens when you start learning something that you by definition didn't know about, especially something like working with data or programming, is that you start thinking in a whole different way, right? So your mind, which was entrenched in, you know, a certain pattern of thought, all of a sudden switches over to something completely different, right? So let's say that you were, uh, I don't know, working in, in marketing before and all of a sudden, and you know, you, you worked in Excel and you worked with data, right? in Excel for the longest time and you produce reports and all that stuff. And now you're learning to do the same work, to work with the same data in a way that com that requires a completely new way of thinking, which is by the way, also a lot more efficient and a lot more powerful because right now you are, as you're going through this course and you're learning these skills, all of a sudden your mind is exploding. You're like, oh my God, if it only takes me this long to do this thing, Think of all the other things that I can do. Can we try this and can we try this? Um, so this is the kind of the kind of mindset change that uh, really drives what we do, right? Yeah, yeah, it makes a lot of sense. I wonder if you couldn't give sort of a specific example just to sort of illustrate that, because I because I think that can be super powerful in an organization to get not just the technical innovation staff, but, but all of the staff thinking about how they can work to improve processes and product consistently. Definitely. Yeah. So, um, I'll, um, share an example. And after that, I'll, uh, actually go through my, uh, prepared three points here, which I wanted to touch on because I think they're really important. Um, and this is just a more kind of organized way to, uh, to, to tackle the topic, which hopefully will be helpful sure. to listeners. So, one example uh, that I can share, and this is something that we see a lot. So pretty much our our bread and butter um, right now in terms of the skills that we teach, like you mentioned, are pretty hard skills, right? So they're starting from programming skills all the way to, uh, you know, machine learning and LP. Um, so they're, they're pretty hard skills. Um, that said, our bread and butter is really at the beginning, right? So... Um, learning to to use python learning to um to to do to, to work with data right using python learning these concepts that you need now most people who take our courses are usually not completely data naive right so they've worked with data perhaps they've worked in excel or um or perhaps they've worked with ah that's me there you go <laughs> excel i got you lose me a python <laughs> Well, I, I am sure that you are not lost for good. I have full faith in you. If you ever need it, <laughs> hit me up. Um, but one thing that one thing that I see over and over again in these folks is that they come into a class and they have a track record track record of working in Excel and uh, doing all this like um, quote unquote analytical busy work is what I call it, right? Producing reports, making data pretty. Um, sure. Right. Sure. So all of these things happen. The correct shading in the, uh, in the, in the boxes. Yeah, exactly. Yes. Coloring the little boxes, you know, you have to, yeah, yes, yeah. Yeah. So, and that's great 
and it's a it's it's very important right for for consuming data and for sharing it within the company but a lot of those tasks are so repetitive that if you think about it you're you're using actual time in your life just doing the same thing over and over again right you are the algorithm exactly right so one thing that many people kind of one wow moment that people have in our um, uh, intro level classes pretty much is the fact that oh my god this thing that i used to do that took me two hours every week and it's the same thing will take me like five minutes moving forward because i can write this like 10 line script that does exactly that right so once you get to that realization it's kind of like, oh my God, I don't have to spend time doing this, right? And look at all these other uh, things. I see, and then they look for, and then they look for other <laughs> opportunities to create the same kind of efficiencies. Exactly. I see, I see, okay. Exactly. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. That's make, okay, so let's get to your, I love three takeaways. Let's, <laughs> let's get to your three takeaways. Great, so three takeaways um, about uh, really what's happening right now with the great resignation and thinking about why are people resigning? Why are people leaving? Uh, and how do technical skills really fit into this? And how, how would, you know, fostering this kind of growth and skills um, help companies to, to get ahead of this? Number one, the most important thing to consider is that this technology, technologies that automate work, technologies that involve AI to, 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 to do increasingly more things is not going away, right? So this is something that's coming, whether we are ready for it or not, it's happening, right? So as a as a company, you know, we can choose to 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 go with it and to to take advantage of it, or we can choose to not, right? And let our competitors do it. Um, so that's one thing that's happening. And believe it or not, your best employees are going to want to to be a part of that change, right? Absolutely. Think back to the early 2000s or perhaps mid 2000s is a better um, uh, example, right? When when the whole software wave started, right? And everybody started adopting software tools and whole bunches of work got automated, right? From CRM to marketing automation to, to email, everything, right? So when that happened, there were a lot of people who were skeptical, right? They were like, oh, it's not going to last, right? It's just it's just a trend, right? It's just something it's just something that, you know, flash in the pan. And lo and behold, it lasted. And the people who yeah. ended up thriving through that wave, through that change, were the people who not only were able to master the tools, but who were able to use them to take it a step further, right? To say, okay, well, this thing yeah. is improving my productivity. It's improving, you know, it's it's freeing up some of my time what can I do with the rest of my time to add value to the bottom line? Sure. Sure. So that is one thing. And you can think about, okay, maybe that's at an individual level. So then people would want to stay competitive, <clears throat> but at the organization level, the best organizations are getting on board with this trend, right? They are, they're becoming leaner. They're becoming more efficient. Um, unfortunately for us, um, whether we like it or not, some of these, you know, resignations will impact the bottom line of a company, right? Some of them may or may not end up ending up being needed, right? If a company, uh, you know, implements the right tools and the right processes, they may be able to do more with less. But for that, there's a very strong investment required specifically in the people who are there. Because mm -hmm. at the end of the day, there's no amount of tools that you can have that will replace all of your people. It's good to know. <laughs> it's good to know. As a business owner, it's you're in the, same, in the yeah. same place, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. And, and um, <laughs> the other thing that it's surfacing for me at this moment is, you know, I came into the conversation thinking, oh, this will help you have, uh, you know, retain your existing technical staff and, uh, you know, train uh, non-technical staff really focused on sort of the product. Most of my work is in technology, mm -hmm. focusing on the, on the product that you're creating, mm -hmm. but you're, you're bringing up a good point, which is just the business of being a business could use a better, uh, a better level of data literacy 
and sort of uh, technical literacy uh, for for having nothing to do with the actual product that the company is creating, but having to do with how the how the company is run. That 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 might do. Do you? Well, here's a question: Do you think that in the future, all businesses, regardless of whether they have a technical product, will need to have this kind of expertise in house? Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, wow. there's no such thing. Wow. There's no such thing as a not okay. technical product. If you're a company in today's marketplace, first of all, do you guys use, as an example, do you use any of the technologies that were introduced in the early 2000s? Do you use CRM? Do you use marketing technology, marketing automation? We use it. Well, we have our own stack, but yeah, I mean, uh, our firm has been uh, virtual <laughs> since its inception. So we've always run it using technology. Um, and you know, we, we consider ourselves pretty technically savvy, but we've never looked under the hood of any of these mm -hmm. things. That's right. Now, from a, from a technology perspective. Yeah, that's, that's good. And that's how it's, that's how it's intended to be. Right. So, so you were able to adopt these technologies and then to move on and do what you do best, right. Which is create mm -hmm. innovative and advise on creating innovative products. Now, let me ask you this. How many companies, how many law firms in the 90s do you think we're using these technologies and how much time do you think it took them to do the things that these technologies are doing for you right now well i mean it's completely different i mean the law libraries were still not all uh digitized at that point and there's lots of lawyers that are still working predominantly in paper um so you know we 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 follow pretty closely in our industry sort of technology adoption and and we really are fairly advanced in comparison to a lot of our peers, uh, but everyone's using it now. I mean, if at the very least in a, a pretty robust document management system. Absolutely. Absolutely. And there's, and this is also an example. I think you hit the nail on the head, Rebecca, about the difference, right? So you can choose to be, <clears throat> you can choose to do things the old fashioned way, or you can choose to adopt some, you know, some, some new technologies. You can choose to, 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 play around and see what works for you and how you could make it work for you. And then use the rest of the time and the increased productivity to, to go further. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, yeah. Okay. So, so, so I, <laughs> I get that this is, this is a, an ability to train existing staff. This is a benefit for retaining existing staff, investing in their future, et cetera. Um, what else? What, what, what are the other reasons? So we've been through two reasons so far. So the fact that these things are happening, AI is coming, automation is happening, whether we like it or not. The second one is that companies out there are doing it anyway. Your competitors are doing it anyway. So yeah. it's, you know, like a few years ago, it was about staying ahead of the curve. Right now, it's a bit about catching up, you know, uh, sure. making sure that you're, yeah. that you're kind of like, you know, going with the flow. Um, the third reason, yeah. um, the third um, point that I wanted to make here is about um, attracting talent and keeping talent, which is really right on the money. You know, at the end of the day, you can look at these, um, you can look at the organization level and you'll realize that, look, as a company, you know, we can keep doing what we're doing. And in some cases we may, you know, we may survive, we may withstand the test of time and never change. But we'll be a dinosaur, and there are so many examples out there for companies who did not focus on what's next, who did not look at ways to innovate, who did just that became dinosaurs, right? Um, and one thing that's happening uh, right now is that companies are adopting these things, but right now they're kind of, you know, AI and automation and and uh, data. Really, uh, and when I when I say automation, I just mean about I, I just refer to automation when it comes to working with data, pretty much, because that I think is uh, a really big task that a lot of knowledge workers are are working on. Um, and when it comes to attracting talent, right now, um, one thing that we need to keep in mind, I think, is the fact that smart people want to do smart things, right? The people that we all want to attract, that we want to work for us, they want to be engaged, they want to be challenged, and they want a company that will, uh, you know, invest in them and respect their time, right? So that, hands down, that is a 
an attractive proposal right there. Um, there is record interest in learning how to work with data because so many more functions, right? And so many more yeah. right, um, jobs that did not involve data before now involve data, working with data, right? So, so the people that, that uh, companies are going after want this, right? And they're going to go for those companies that enable them. Um, and finally, the last thing is that keeping talent um, is obviously self-explanatory, right? It's the number one thing that comes to mind, right? Why would we invest in training? Well, because if we show our people that we care about them, they're going to be less likely to not care about us, right? And to move on. They're going to be a lot less likely. Um, so there's that. And at the executive level, honestly, it's it's really, really extra crucial um, uh, to, to, to really invest in these skills. Um, last thing that I want, I'm going to say before I end on this question, um, <clears throat> there was this, uh, uh, study that I found, I believe it was done by a company called Splunk. Have you heard of it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, um, it was, it was a survey published on, I found it on the internet. So apparently they surveyed, um, something like 1300 executives and I use this example a lot. So it's, it's, kind of like my uh my my has been my go-to example for like the past month <laughs> pretty much when talking to people on this topic uh, because i find it mind-blowing so out of 1300 senior executives i have my notes here um they um they asked us how important they think are how important they think their, the data skills are for their for their role right so that was the question that was asked and these are non-technical these are non-technical. These are non-technical folks. folks, right? So executives, yeah. leaders of companies who do not have a technical role, right? There, there's nothing. There's no product, technical product right. expectation of them. Um, so, out of 1,300 senior executives, 81 81 percent agree that data skills are required to become a senior leader in their company, right? So, no matter what, just a senior leader, you have to have data skills. Yeah. But get this, 67% say that they're not comfortable accessing or using data themselves. Hmm. So just think about that imposter syndrome for a second. Yeah. <laughs> you know? yeah. 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 We've got a gap. Yeah. Absolutely. And the thing, in, you know, other than knowing about the, the kinds of skills that your technical staff needs to have and the work that they're doing, you know, let's say that you don't have any technical staff, right? You've never been in a position to, 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 you know, manage or have to recruit technical staff. Now we come back again to the question of how long do you think that's going to be the case, right? How are you willing to bet your future on that? Yeah. I mean, I guess I'm interested in your, uh, your vision of what the future looks like, right? Like what is the, what is the, what is the workplace for these kinds of companies look like in future? Is it, are, are the roles changing? Is it just take a completely different skill set? The roles are definitely changing. Um, and the roles are changing in ways in which, um, perhaps we wouldn't expect them to change, but also if, if we were to look at concrete examples, we accept the fact that they're changing, right? So the fact that if you think about it, um, who used to work with data, right? Let's say 10 years ago, 15 years ago, it used to be data analysts and it used to be data scientists, you know, engineers worked with data, right? Because they had their, you know, uh, data generated from whatever products they built. Um, but if you look at who's working with data nowadays, right? And if you're looking at, also, organizations at a at a large scale, um, <clears throat> I think, and and I say this, I, I say that I make I'm about to make a, a blanket statement, um, and, and the fact that I'm ready. already I'm going to make the blanket statement that everybody all everybody running an organization or a department or a team would like to be considered, um, you know, innovative. They would like to be considered. Um, to be data driven, right? To make their decisions in a non-biased mm -hmm. way, right? Mm -hmm. Myself included, right? <laughs> um, so yeah. 
we all want to be to to consider and, and we think of ourselves as unbiased and data driven and we aspire to those things. Um, but what does it really mean to be data driven if working with data is something that you dread or you struggle with, right? Like these sixty seven yeah. percent of of executives. And I'm not saying that these people should all go and, and take a Python course and start to code. <laughs> That's not what I'm suggesting. Um, what I'm suggesting, though, is that if this is a gap that they've identified themselves in themselves, this is most definitely a gap that exists in their organization, because the culture in an organization is set from the top. Oh, and here's cool. another thing that I wanted to, to point out just on this on the take a, a Python course kind of thing. Um, you and basically everybody, and I'm not saying that everybody should learn to code. I'm not saying that. But what I'm saying is that everybody should be exposed to this way of thinking. Everybody should be exposed. Yeah. Everybody should give it a go. And the truth is that you don't have to be, you don't have to be an expert really to, to reap benefits from this. You don't have to end sure. up going and being an engineer. Um, yeah, it just changes the way you think. And another important thing is that um, it, another example, which uh, is very close to home to me is myself. Um, when I took my first programming class in college, I was so horrendous at it that I am so immature also because I was not, I guess this is a, a statement to, to who I was at the time, a very young person, that I I dropped out halfway through. I was like, this is not for me. Mm. Uh, I'm not going to be yeah. able to, to make it. I have no idea. Um, and so I dropped out and then I think it was like a year later when I took another one and it was a, a very, like a completely different instructor, um, different, like, you know, same textbook, um, different instructor, same topic. And it just blew my mind. And I got an A in that class and I liked it so much mm. that I was like, this makes so much sense. And mind you, I was an economics major, <laughs> right? So I didn't expect to go on and be right. a, an engineer. <clears throat> so it is possible. So stick yeah. with it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, and it's and 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 teaching matters. And teaching matters exactly. Yeah. 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 So, okay. So, so I'm going to put all the information about Edlitera in the show notes so that people can sort of look up the company and see what you guys are up to. Um, I want to close with your thoughts about one thing that digital health innovators could do right now today to supercharge their success. Absolutely. So one thing that they can do right now to, to, to get ahead of the curve, uh, if that, that perhaps that's a bit overused, but to, to get to get ahead and to, to make use. It works. It works, right? There you go, okay. So to get ahead of the curve. Yeah. <laughs> um, one thing that you can do right now is to look, take a hard look at what you're doing, at what you're working on, at what your team is working on, and consider the ways in which those processes can be improved. Consider the ways in which there is slack consider the ways in which there is and not slack by you know people are not doing what they're supposed to do but what are some ways in which you can you know remove some of the stuff that is not crucial um right what is the way in which some ways in which you can automate you know automate the boring stuff there's a book that's called that by the way i strongly recommend it it's really good um <laughs> and it's a python book incidentally <laughs> so um, but yeah, so look at, take a hard look at that. There is, um, and this is another, uh, survey study that I'm going to mention, which I don't remember the source of, and this is horrible because <laughs> sources. Well, send it to me afterwards. I'll, I'll add it to the show notes But well. the most important thing, um, that this study identified, the number one most important thing, um, that, um, non-technical executives, um, found difficult about working about using analytics more and using their data more was the fact that they didn't understand they didn't know how data and analytics could help their bottom line their their team their company they just didn't couldn't think about about it right they're like oh we're doing this this works why do we need to do anything yeah. else what can we do with this 
Um, and that's really where you need to slip into a different mindset. You need to look for the ways in which you can take advantage of this. Because if you look 10 years down the line, just imagine that we're in, you know, 2010 right now, or, or even before that, 10, 15 years, right? 2005. If you look 10 years down the line, it's not unlikely that that is what the world is going to be like. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> it reminds me that Slack was actually created as like an internal communication and efficiency tool in a company that itself didn't, was not successful, but, uh, but they sort of created this to create, uh, they created the technology to help them communicate better and manage projects better. And that became, it's got to be a unicorn, right? Absolutely. Yeah. No, I mean, they're huge. They're huge. And that's, that's what they're, yeah. that's their product yeah. now. That's what they do. Yeah. So, okay. So I really enjoyed this conversation, Claudia. I always like to look sort of into the future, what things are going to look like. And I don't often talk about workforce issues, but this is a great reminder that, you know, attracting and retaining technical staff and non-technical staff uh, is uh, is incredibly important to overall business success and could be assisted by really investing in these kinds of, uh, you know, these kinds of learnings. So I, I really appreciate your time. And um, I'm going to follow up with you about that Python course. <laughs> Definitely. I will... Possibly not in 2022, but at some point <laughs> I'm going to take you up on this. Offer. I would love to have you in one of my classes. <laughs> going to the break and have a great time. <laughs> yes, well, to your point, who knows what possibilities that might open up in my mind. So um, it would be an investment for sure, for <laughs> sure. All right, so um, thank you for listening today. You can access this. Uh, podcast wherever you like to listen to podcasts. If you'd like to follow us, please subscribe. And we look forward to speaking with you in two weeks. Thanks so much for having me on the show, Rebecca. Really, really enjoyed this. Take care. All right. Take care.